Good evening and welcome back to the old England Journal of Medicine. It's off to the former colonies today as recently I had the sterling fortune to while away an evening with two gentlemen from the North American continent. Of course, one of whom has recently taken up appointment here in Great Britain as Sir William Osler, with whose work no doubt many of you will be familiar. Syrup guzzling Canadians are mostly tolerable company, but he insisted on bringing with him one of those uncouth Americans, a certain Dr. William Holstead, who by Jove is a ruddy addict. A fine surgeon, no doubt, but Gadzook's man. He was buzzing like a canary with his chuff in the snuff. Osler told me in confidence that the blighter is unable to operate unless he has injected cocaine, to mention nothing of the three grains of morphine that has become his daily ritual, according to my wife, who spoke with his wife, who overheard his valet's wife. I'm sure you utilize in your practice cocaine as an effective and safe local anesthetic, but you might not be aware that it also has some um, recreational uses. Nevertheless, we're not boring the company collected at the Royal College with interminable talk of radical mastectomies. He shared with us the most entertaining recent correspondence from the noted German physician Dr. August Beer. The Yankee Dodge ether has been in common use as an anaesthetic agent since the recently departed Queen Victoria's early reign, but as we are all aware, patients were often discourteous enough to expire mid-operation. Dashed inconsiderate, personally I didn't see any particular problem with this, but Beer, evidently possessing the sensitive heart of a woman, wished to examine cocaine's properties not only as a local anaesthetic, but as a regional block allowing major surgeries to be performed by cocainizing the spinal cord itself. He begins by detailing how to inject into the correct cerebrospinal space a procedure that causes a beastly headache due to leakage of the fluid contained therein, and then he lists his initial subject. I shall read directly. Number one. A 34-year-old labourer who was hopelessly riddled with tuberculosis. He had suffered many complications from earlier general anaesthetics and dreaded another one. I therefore proposed spinal cocainization to him, and he accepted. After administration, he felt nothing in the lower half of his body, and I sawed off his leg, and he felt no pain. Two hours after the operation, his back and left leg became painful, and the patient vomited and complained of severe headache, which persisted for two days. Number two, a 17-year-old baker suffered from osteomyelitis of the tibia. He witters on a bit as Germans are, are wont to do about protocol. Waffle, waffle, Fritz, yes, just get on with it. But aha, I enjoyed this part. After administration of the cocaine, the operation delighted the patient who laughed and chatted with great enthusiasm and excitement. But lo, a crashing depression and severe headache ensued. Number three. A 14-year-old boy suffered no from tuberculosis. So no other problems. The boy complained unceasingly and was too backward and uncooperative for any tests of sensation. These six cases demonstrate that a small volume of cocaine solution introduced into the dural sac renders a large part of the body insensitive, enabling major operations of that region to be performed without causing pain. However, I still encountered complications. To reach a well-informed opinion, I decided to perform some cocaine investigations upon myself. On August 24, 1898, I had Dr. Hildebrand perform a lumbar puncture on me and inject a half syringe of 1% solution of cocaine. Unfortunately, most of it escaped and no insensibility was achieved. Because of the considerable loss of cerebrospinal fluid, I postponed the repetition of the procedure on myself until a later occasion, but Dr. Hildebrand immediately offered to have the same study performed on himself without delay. The study was a great success, and its performance on a well-informed physician resulted in an excellent account of the action of cocaine on the spinal cord. I shall describe my findings. I introduced cocaine in the usual way. After seven minutes, needle pricks in the thigh were perceived as pressure tickling of the sole of the foot was barely felt. After eight minutes, a small incision in the skin of the thigh was felt as pressure. Introduction of a large, blunt, curved needle into the soft tissues of Dr. Hildebrand's thigh produced no pain at all. After ten minutes, a long needle was pushed down to the bone without evoking the least pain. 
pinching the skin severely and seizing and crushing it in toothed forceps was experienced as only pressure. After 13 minutes, a burning cigar was applied to both of Dr. Hildebrand's legs, felt as heat but not as pain. After 18 minutes, strong pinching was hardly felt at all below the nipples. After 20 minutes, a vulsion of pubic hairs was felt simply as elevation of a fold of skin, but a vulsion of chest hair above the nipples on the contrary was very painful. Strong hyperextension of the toes was not unpleasant. After 23 minutes, a strong blow to the shin with an iron hammer did not provoke pain. After 25 minutes, strong pressure and traction on the testicles was not painful. After 32 minutes, tickling the sole of the foot was perceived as faint touch, needling repeatedly down to the femur and strong pressure on the testicle were not painful. After 40 minutes, strong blows on the shin did not hurt. The entire body began to perspire gently. After 42 minutes, constriction by a rubber tube tourniquet around the side produced no pain, but around the upper arm was extremely painful. After 45 minutes, pain sensibility began to recover, but was still considerably obtunded. After performing these experiments on our own bodies, we proceeded without feeling any symptoms to dine and drink wine and smoke cigars. I slept the whole night, awoke the next morning hale and hearty, and went for an hour's walk. Toward the end of the walk, I developed a slight headache, which gradually got worse and I was forced to take to bed for nine days, after which I thoroughly enjoyed an eight-day hunting trip. Dr. Hildebrand, for his part, went to bed feeling entirely well, but was nevertheless unable to get to sleep due to an agitated state. At midnight, a violent headache set in that quickly became insupportable. At 1 a.m. he began to vomit, and this recurred once later in the night. The next morning he felt very ill, but as I was unable to work, I told him not to neglect his duties and with much effort he was able to operate on the day's patients. His legs became painful and bruises developed in many places, especially over the tibia, where sensibility had been tested by crushing and heavy blows. These researches demonstrate that an extremely small solution of cocaine injected into the subarachnoid <laughs> These Germans are an absolute riot to waste all that good cocaine on an assistant surgeon. If I want to wallop Percy here with an iron hammer or to crush his testicles, I'll bally well do it with kind of cocaine. And if he wants to be employed by any surgeon in the Empire, he will thank me for it. After all, the Germans invented that infernal homeopathy. I'll just tell him I'm using German homeopathic cocaine. <laughs> German medicine is like German automobiles, unlikely to last. British manufacturing, now that will last forever. Ah, oh, Germans, they really have no ambition. I doubt we'll hear a peep from that meek country this century. What a privilege to unearth this entirely real and genuine archive footage from over 100 years ago. So many thanks to the Old England Journal of Medicine's archivists for digging it out. Now, I'm sure you all know that uh, Coca-Cola did indeed used to contain cocaine, leading to their famous first corporate slogan, you just can't beat the real thing. No, man, you just can't beat it. It's great. It's awesome, man. Have you heard about Coca-Cola? It's better than Pepsi. Yes, Pepsi can suck a dick because Coke is so great. Yeah, boy, I love Coke. But you might not know that cocaine was indeed commonly used in medicine around the turn of the 20th century. German pharmaceutical company Merck, who are a major player today, started by producing small amounts around 1860. Through the 1870s, total annual production was only 50 grams of cocaine, which frankly is a quiet night for some of my friends. From the 1880s, its medicinal uses really took off as Merck started marketing it as a cure to um, to morphine addiction. A young doctor called Sigmund Freud wrote a glowing 70-page document called Uber Cocaine, extolling its virtues. And it was Freud's friend, Dr. Koller, who realized its use as a topical, meaning on the surface, anesthetic agent for the eye, not only numbing it, but reducing bleeding as well. In 1885, Merck produced 83,343 kilograms of cocaine, which Frankly, is a quiet night for some of my friends. Here are some patents taken out around this time. Cocaine toothache drops, instantaneous cure, 
Metcalfe's coca wine for fatigue of mind or body, and voice tabloids with cocaine, chlorate of potash, and borax. In 1887, the US Surgeon General recommended that cocaine be used to treat depression, claiming that there was no such thing as cocaine addiction. And this was when William Holstead, about whom you've already heard, started experimenting on himself. Have you ever wondered why US doctors start rounding their patients so damn early in the morning and work such crazy hours? Well, it can be directly traced back to Holstead, whose manic nature and work ethic, driven in part by cocaine, combined with his huge impact on modern American medicine, has resulted in generations of residents starting their ward rounds of patients at 5 a.m. for no good reason. Now, I literally wrote the book on recreational drugs and the heart, and believe me, cocaine is not advisable. It can cause heart attacks in even the most healthy young person for a number of quite interesting reasons, such as making the blood vessels spasm and kind of clamp shut, as well as making the blood itself more sticky. So instead of doing cocaine, why not do what I do when I want an upper and watch some forbidden movies? Now, you're probably bored of content creators swearing that they love whatever is sponsoring their video. Right, uh, where was I? Yes, content creators seeming a little disingenuous when they pretend to love whatever sponsoring their video. So let me demonstrate that I'm not just saying that I like ExpressVPN because they're sponsoring this video, which they are, but I can demonstrate to you that I practice what I preach because as you'll see here, I signed up and have been a customer of ExpressVPN since 2019. And I actually signed up using the exact same deal that I'm offering you today. And that is getting three free months if you sign up right now at expressvpn.com forward slash medlife, I use public Wi-Fi networks a lot and I like the extra layer of security, like here in the hospital where uh, it's all unsecured. What I mean by that is unencrypted. And what ExpressVPN does is it encrypts 100% of your network data and reroutes it through their secure servers so that any nefarious miscreant hacker connected to the same Wi-Fi network can't steal your data. And let's be real, the NHS isn't exactly known for its IT security. And ExpressVPN also protects you from network admins or internet providers seeing all the sites that you're visiting. And ExpressVPN allows you to choose a server location to connect through so you can change your online location and then use something like Netflix, for example. A friend of mine recently recommended a movie called Upgrades and I found it had been removed from UK Netflix. However, I knew that I could look up online and see that it's in Canada. And then I can go here and using the uh, ExpressVPN, I can change my online location to Canada, the country of um, syrup guzzling Dr. William Osler that you've already heard about. And then I could watch the movie as if I'm in Canada and um, while eating poutine and punching a hockey player. What's more, I recently learned that you can sign up for Peacock via the USA uh, on ExpressVPN and watch Premier League football for only $5 a month, which was a real revelation to me because that's an order of magnitude less than you pay for a TV package to watch the football here. And by the way, I'm talking about soccer. Uh, those of you from a country that uses football to describe a sport that is famously mostly played with the hands. To be honest, you all know what VPNs do. So what I'll say is why I chose and why I stay with the ExpressVPN, which is that it doesn't slow or get in the way of my internet use. It's consistently rated as the best provider. And my clever friends who know about internet security say it's their choice too. So that's three entirely free metric months, which are the same as normal months, of ExpressVPN by clicking the link below expressvpn.com forward slash medlife. Remember, I would say rather than giving me money on Patreon or anything like that, if you support me via sponsor signups, then you get something out of it along with helping me. Well, I'm off to inject potentially lethal drugs into my subordinate spine. I trust you are spending your day in a similar way. Until next time, Hildebrand!